Hi, I'm Larry Dignan with Constellation Insights, and we're here with Dwayne Griffin. He is CDO and CIO of Insight Global. Hey, Dwayne, how you doing? Hey, Larry, I'm doing great, man. How are you doing today? Good. Caught up with you at CCE. Welcome to the BT150. So I guess just set us up with what Insight Global does and how long you've been in the role. Oh, awesome, man. Well, yeah, it was good Good to kind of catch up with you just here at CCE. Uh, we, we caught up. We, we found out we got the same workout routine in addition to... We also uh, just That's had a right. great time, I think, networking. It was it was a great it was a great event. I picked the wrong Peloton. You ain't you ain't gonna pick on me about that, but I did. The, the Peloton uh, lottery, it happened. Yeah, Peloton lottery. Pick pick the wrong one of that. But tell you just a little bit about myself and uh, Insight Global. Uh, as you said, I'm our Chief Digital and Information Officer, and uh, I joined Insight Global uh, in June of 2023. And actually, my path to my current role is really really interesting because my relationship with Insight Global didn't start then. It actually started back in 2021, where I actually joined as a board of directors member. I started on the board and sat on the board, helped a lot with some of our digital transformation work. And I came off the board last year to kind of really take uh, more of the guidance of the board role and to help like execute some of the plans. I really made that shift after a 22 year career working at uh, State Farm Insurance, where I was uh, last our, our chief data officer. So kind of growing up in technology, I've done big technology, and now I'm here working at Insight Global, which we, we basically, in the simplest form, we just help people find jobs. Uh, we do that by, by really building, uh, we have relationships with companies all across the Fortune 1, uh, 1000, uh, where we just kind of really help understand what are their hiring needs and, and in, in understanding and, and what are the needs and opportunities out there. We really then go and work with uh, a, a wide, wide field of candidates that that eventually um, we go through matching and we help identify becoming our contractors and help really kind of put them to work. Uh, we do that, you know, we're not just a, a staffing and professional services company. Uh, we're really a premier company because the the care we go about uh, that process with our clients, as well as our consultants in which we kind of hire and help put to work, we just we just do that in a special way. And my job is really simply uh, to kind of help really power that connection through the through use of technology, which is which is pretty fun. So what's what's the role of data in that case um, when you're you know, you're bringing on people and, and you're trying to fit them in roles? I guess. How, how does data play into this? Well, I mean, data is data is all I mean, you know, we live we live in a world that that we were we're just we're still in the early parts, but we totally understand we're in a data rich world. Um, there's there's the known data and then there's the data that we're still exploring. A big a big part of why there's a digital uh, I'm in the digital aspect of my role is because we are still going to uh, going through digitization of various parts of our business to understand insights to understand meaning that then will help us deliver our services at a at a higher level. So data is a critical part, but the anchor of data in our business it really starts with our candidate slash consultant population. Uh, we have anywhere from up to like 30,000 um, consultants who, uh, who who trust in us in helping put them to work and meeting the needs of our clients. And you can imagine the rich pool of data we have, not only from understanding that pool of population, but also understanding the candidates, which is in the millions that we work through in our 20 plus year history to help do that match. So what are companies looking for in terms of technology? You know, we're it's it's interesting because we're we're coming we're dealing with the time right now. And if you think about okay, where do we help provide our, our staffing and professional services to? A core part of our business is starting with the technology sector. Um, you know, all the big names that you can think that are out there. And uh it's been a really difficult market uh here over the past few years where the market has kind of contracted in terms of what some of those needs are. Uh, where those needs are at, I mean, you, you and I know if there's any role in technology that has AI connected to it, there's a high demand to it. What are those roles? They go back to the data roles. They go back to the data science roles. They go back to some of the engineering roles. So that's, that's still a heavy play. You're also seeing needs uh, heavily around where cybersecurity is playing a key role at and skills that are needed there in, in various disciplines. Uh, so from a tech sector, that's what we're seeing. But that's not the only space in which we help provide our services to. We help. We we have our services to the healthcare sector. We we can uh, really fill roles end to end in any hospital. There's a lot of needs around nursing. There's a lot of needs around. I mean, right now we do a lot of work helping with immunization season. You know, getting your flu vaccine or getting your COVID update. 
So it kind of ranges across industries and markets, and there's different pockets of just new roles and new explorations that are coming up that we're, we're, we're really following the market conditions to, to go after. So how are you using AI internally um, in the hiring process and, and just basically how, how, you're, how you're approaching AI in general? You know, it, AI has been a really fun journey that uh, I've, I've been able to kind of help take, take the company on. I mentioned I started in June of last year, right? June, 2023. And we all know last year, Gen AI just like took, generative AI took over the entire conversation of AI and, and where, where the company was at when I started in general was that we were like just protecting ourselves from it. It was, you know, having access to infamously open AI's chat GPT was not available and all the other places it was popping up. But when you kind of fast forward of where we have done uh, and where AI has made a difference for us at, it has started with where the richness of our data sets that I mentioned earlier and it's around candidate or consultant data. We have really used AI to help really do industry matching to client needs for certain skills. That's against our pool of candidates, as well as our, our available consultants that are coming off engagements that are available in the market. We've used AI, not, not the generative AI, more of the machine learning, the predictive uh, modeling pieces to where we can do that various matching. But one of the most exciting spaces, I'll say real quickly, Larry, that we've done it at, that, that is a, a really good differentiation for us has been an ability when we are when we are offering when we're helping align a candidate uh, who's been interviewed and selected for an opportunity by a hiring manager, we go to put them in uh, we go to put them to work and let's say that data is four weeks out. We've developed some AI that uh, modeling that has helped us identify if there's a risk because of competing offers because of the nature of the hiring or delays whatever that that candidate or consultant of ours isn't able to show up. And we have come up with just behaviors with the hiring managers as our clients and for our recruiters to help mitigate against that. We call that a back out. And that's been a really fun space that we've been able to help the business really pull through the, 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 the earned business that we have with our clients, as well as build out trust. So that's been a really fun space we've been able to do, see AI make a difference in. How are you finding uh, AI? How are you finding um, the hiring process for AI internally for your roles? You know, it's into, we we recently. This is a space we're really been been focused on because because of where what our services are around people helping people find work. We recently just did like a survey of um, over a thousand hiring managers. You think hiring managers in the U.S. with a hundred plus more employees and just getting feedback on where AI is at in the hiring process. And and overall, the the this is kind of some of the early insights from that is there have been significant investments and value add of AI being used in uh, applicant suitability for positions, skills assessments, um, training, cybersecurity training. Uh, there's also this nuance of that while AI has really enhanced and is, is, there's a lot of confidence and value and efficiency that it's made in the hiring process, it still cannot replace the human decision making that has to be engaged with that. So we're seeing the investments have been made to streamline and they're being really effective, but how the human decision-making intersects with it is where we're just kind of hearing back early sentiments from the survey that some of the differentiation is playing out across our client base. So where do you think the human sits in the loop for that in terms of, I mean, I know people who are looking for jobs and, and you know, part of it's dancing around those, part of it's dancing around those screening algorithms and other parts, just like the, the sheer overload of uh, applicants, um, I, I guess, where do you put that human in the loop? Yeah, and it, it really it really comes in between the connection between that hiring manager and that recruiting that is occurring with that preferred candidate of, is there a touch point to where there's actually human interaction that can assess behaviors around culture fit, behaviors around not only the, the raw hard skills that are on the resumes, that are synthesized through the tooling that's reviewing the resumes or that can come across even in a, a one-way video interview, but how that gets matched into, and it's gonna get experienced, the way that that employee shows up, whether it's a remote assignment or it's in person, there's gotta be a human interaction between that recruiter themselves, which is, which is again, that's the difference for us and what the services we can offer. But in addition to with that hiring manager and that connection, that's where you're seeing that human decision-making coming in and being an input. What would you recommend to 
you know, graduating university students right now in terms of you're, you're trying to play AI, you're, you're applying different places, I guess. It sounds like Insight Global is more of a senior, you know, people in the field, generally speaking. Um, but I guess, how would you, how would you tell a college graduate to play this? Yeah, no, and I would say we're not, we're definitely not, not a senior. We're helping, okay. um, you know, many that are out of college looking to start their careers with skills that, that do not want to start with full-time employment, but yet want to get experiences. And many times they can get experiences is through contract work, right? But it's not only just the contract work that we're able to, to do and provide for them. Some It's also the large um, professional service engagements that we can do where we're forming scrum teams, where we're, we're delivering not only um, skills of application development, we're running call centers, we're supporting um, extended help desk, we're gaining skills for the for the workforce that wants to grow into a career, but want to grow it through a different path. So, so that's that's where we're at. So, the advice I would give is that you know it's all about staying sharp in your your actual skills, your technical skills, but enhancing that with your soft skills, because uh, what what can get lost in this world, especially with with so many different digital interactions, and in, throughout the process, it's very digital. There's video interviews. Um, there's a lot of online interviews, but the soft skills come out online and they come out when there's in-person interactions as well. So adding that to their repertoire as they're coming out of college and preparing for those careers and those different work opportunities, that's the advice I would add in because we we think those things are lost. Well, I can be remote and I may never have to be uh, in an on-site environment, that, but that doesn't change the way the soft skills manifest themselves to be employable. That's what I would share. And what, what's on your uh, innovation agenda for 2025? You know, it's, it's uh, so innovation never stops, right? Because there's there's always disruptive forces, whether they're market driven, you heard me describe a little earlier, some market challenges, or they're driven from just disruption, new things that are done by key competitors or new demands. You know, we're always, we're always in a position to have the agility toward new demands. And next year, one of the things we're really focusing on is the journey of our customers in, in, in a world we're anticipated that with some of where the economic uncertainty that we're operating in that is leading to what is the job posture toward many of our clients is that well the shift of that occurring in the next year is going to require some agility for us to help meet some of those core skills that we talked about earlier ai is still driving a lot of the focus of the skills that are needed by by most of our clients things around data things around cloud that really get into that or things around cyber. So it's for us, it's going to be about innovating and how we're going to be able to position and be there with those demands and those needs of our customers. And we believe being there is where our, our then our people are healthy and effective and overall and delivering our overall service offering. So uh, the innovation gen is just going to be about where does the market conditions really lie us to help meet, meet their needs and being in a position to chase after that using AI in more advanced ways continue to take advantage of our cloud services and, and building out our overall enterprise data strategy. That's a big part of our, I would say, innovation agenda going into next year, which is which is chasing the growth opportunity we have in the market. And what's your um, what's your tech stack look like to do that? Yeah, so technically, I'm, I'm, I actually have a pretty heavy, heavily focused SaaS techno technology stack that really is, is running operationally more predominantly in the cloud with a small data center back uh, back in footprint with some of our, my core corporate uh, functions and applications. So therefore, with, with me being more kind of cloud driven, uh, I've been able to make a lot of agility at the application functional le le level to really take advantage of that. I'm still moving a lot of my data estate to be uh, more modernized around my overall enterprise, just data strategy, building out my data domains that I think will further accelerate some of the things that I can do with AI and help really power the, the flow of the business. How do you anticipate uh, leveraging, you know, the new model stuff as it comes out? I mean, it sounds like you're, it almost sounds like for companies that are getting their data estate in order, they almost are at an advantage now because they had all those buyers build, all the models changed, you know, they change every six months, basically. I guess, what's your strategy there in terms of, you know, how, how do you approach models and model choice and all that? Great, great, great question. I, I literally, so once a month, I write an internal article for our, our company. It's called the, the, from the desk of the CDIO. And I just talk about what are some of the major trends that we're focused on and we're, we're making progress to or that are that are kind of coming up. And one of the things you kind of hit on was about this, this opportunity in technology of buying world-class software 
and then building world-class software. And when I first came into this position, there was a pretty heavily debate on how that was tackled. There was actually, uh, I would say, an unhealthy competitive nature to part of the organization, which was the builders. They believed they could build the world-class and they can do it better than the buyers could buy and or integrate with that. And I come from the school of thought is you have to have the ability to do both. And when you think about how do you do that effectively, Larry, it's through the way you can manage data and manage that to the needs of the business. I think you should buy and build. And that's an important part of our agenda is we have things that we are very invested in and we think makes it special to how we offer our services. We built those things. And then there are things that we have purchased that are world-class that we build in a way that integrates, but we understand the flow of the data between them both. And that's what we managed to. And that's an important part about that data estate. First, I just cannot uh, thank uh, you and the Constellation team for the opportunity to just sit down and, and have this conversation and just being part of the inductee group this uh, year. I had a fantastic time at CCE. Uh, one, of, one of my just standout conference experiences, and I look forward to continue to engage with our, our, our members, our alumni, and continue to just lean on them, making, making technology and business better, which is what I, I feel was a, just a community of connection I felt at CCE to build upon. Well, great having you on board. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Thanks.